This is part 7. In this part, I will discuss corneal crosslinking in terms of mechanism, indications, contraindications, considerations, techniques of application, and alternatives. I hope you will enjoy. This is section 3, management modalities. We are going to start with corneal crosslinking. The mechanism of action of corneal crosslinking is that we use riboflavin, which is vitamin B2, to interact with ultraviolet A to produce oxidative agents. These oxidative agents will increase the bonds between and inter-collagen fibers to increase biomechanical stiffness of the cornea and lead to stability and to stop the progression of keratoconus. The intensity of UV light has been determined to be 3 milliwatt per square centimeter and it has been shown that the safety margin is 300 micron after which this UV light will not affect or will not harm the endothelium so it has been decided that the least uh, corneal thickness should be 400 microns at the thinnest location after removing the epithelium in the epi-off technique. Corneal crosslinking is indicated in progressive keratoconus, non-keratoconus ectasia, including pellucid marginal degeneration, turian marginal degeneration, and other types of keratectasia. It is also indicated to stabilize the corneoplastic procedures like LASIK, PRK, PTK, intracorneal rings, and conductive keratoplasty. In infectious keratitis, still the corneal crosslinking is under study. Till now, it is not superior to traditional treatment. And finally, there is the corneal edema, uh, which is one of the indications of corneal crosslinking in order to shrink the cornea. There are two conditions to use corneal crosslinking. The first one is good corneal thickness, which means above 400 microns at the thinnest location in the AP off technique without epithelium in the AP off technique. And K readings, K max should be less than 60 diopters because it has been shown in some studies that when the K max is above 58 diopters, uh, there was a high rate of failure. Corneal crosslinking is contraindicated in epithelial healing disorders, history of herpes, melting disorders, scarring, and continuous eye rubbing. Techniques of application. There are two types of riboflavin. The first type is 0.1% isotonic with dextran 20%. The other one is 0.1% hypotonic without dextran. Techniques of application. The most agreed uh, protocol till now is the Dresden protocol. It is as follows. Step one, epithelial removal. The epithelium should be removed from over nine millimeter zone. It can be removed by PRK blade or by alcohol or by other means. Step two, imbibition of vitamin B2. An isotonic riboflavin 0.1% should be instilled every five minutes with BSS in between. And at the end of 30 minutes, we have to check pachymetry. If it is over 400 microns without epithelium, because this is an epi-off technique after remover, or removal of epithelium, if it is more than 400 microns, then we go to step three. Otherwise, we have to instill hypotonic riboflavin for about 10 minutes and recheck the pachymetry. We can repeat this part until we gain uh, uh, or until we reach more than 400 microns. Now, it is recommended to avoid putting the speculum during imbibition of vitamin B2. 
there is no need to expose the cornea during this period um, because of dehydration. And this will uh, reduce the amount of uh, losing uh, some thickness and maybe the, um, will uh, prevent using the hypotonic, the need for hypotonic. Step three, UV application. We apply three millimeter watt per square centimeter for, thir three, uh, for 30 minutes over a spot of eight millimeter plus minus according to the diameter of the cornea, putting in mind that we have to leave at least one millimeter of clear cornea um, away from the limbus to avoid destruction of uh, limbal stem cells. During this 30 minutes, we have to instill isoriboflavin every five minutes with BSS in between. Now, there is a very important note here that you as a doctor, you have, it is your, your responsibility to adjust the distance between the eye and the machine. It should be five centimeter. Don't depend on the nurse to do this because if the distance is less than five centimeter, then the endothelium will be uh, destroyed and you may end up with corneal scarring. And if the distance is more than five centimeter, the effect was, will be less than desired. Step four, dressing. We have to use a steep bandage contact lens. Steep means that the base curve is uh, small. It should be like 8.3, not 8.4 or 8.5, because we need to keep the center of the cornea free to, uh, in order to, to give space for the epithelium to replicate. Otherwise, there will be a delayed healing. We have to use topical antibiotics. Non-steroidals are prohibited. Steroids are controversial. Evidence of action. There are two evidence of action. The first one is the demarcation line. It is a virtual line which separates between the anterior two-thirds of the cornea and the posterior one-third. It is virtual because it is uh, due to uh, hyperreflectivity given by the cross-linked tissue in the anterior cornea. When the demarcation line is seen, then corneal cross-linking has worked. But if you don't see the demarcation line, the opposite is not true. The other evidence is the changes in K readings. During the first three months after corneal cross-linking, K readings will increase by two to three diopters. And by the end of post -op, six months post-operatively, the K readings will regress to their original uh, uh, values. After that, the K readings will continue to uh, decrease over 12 to 24 months with additional two to three diopters loss of K readings or, in, or decrease of K readings. The typical clinical findings include reduction of K max by one to two diopters, stability of the cornea, one to two lines gain in corrected distance visual acuity and low to moderate haze up to six months. This haze is different from that one seen after PRK. After PRK, the haze is caused by the apoptosis, while here it is caused by dehydration and the inflammation caused by the oxidative agents. So we, we should not be um, afraid of the haze uh, because it is a good sign, but it should be low to moderate, not severe. And we should not suppress the haze by using intensive steroids. Otherwise, we will lose the effect of corneal cross-linking. 
alternative techniques. As we mentioned, we have to instill vitamin B2 for 30 minutes, and then we have to apply ultraviolet rays for another 30 minutes. So it is a long procedure. Now, in order to search for alternative techniques which are more comfortable for both patients and the medical staff, doctors and scientists tried to analyze the components of this procedure. We have three components, the epithelium, vitamin B2, and ultraviolet A. The first question was, can we reduce the imbibition time? The other question was, can we change the irradiation profile, irradiation time, or change the continuous mode to a pulse mode? The third question was, why don't we keep the epithelium, which is the epion technique, in order to get rid of the pain and the co other complications and uh, to, be, to, to leave uh, or to let the patient be happy. Now, starting with the imbibition time. It has been shown that if we use 0.1 riboflavin for five minutes, then the penetration will be just for about 110 microns. So it will be very superficial. And if we use it for 15 minutes, then it will penetrate to reach maybe 250. It's still superficial. But if we use 30 minutes, then the uh, penetration will exceed 300, but still under 400. So no way to reduce the imbibition time of this type of riboflavin. What about the irradiation time? Can we reduce the irradiation time? In order to achieve the same energy, which is 5.4 joule per square centimeter, we have to use 3 milliwatt for 30 minutes, or 9 milliwatt for 10 minutes, or 30 milliwatt for 3 minutes, or 9, uh, 90 milliwatt for one minute. But the big question is, are we going to have the same cross-linking efficacy? It has been shown that if we increase the irradiation power, we will still have the same effect of biomechanical stiffness measured by Young module until we reach the 20 milliwatt per square centimeter. After that, the effect will start decreasing. And in other studies showed that this threshold point was 18 milliwatt. Therefore, the highest power that can be used should not exceed 18 milliwatt per square centimeter. Now coming to the pulse mode, Still, it is not evidence-based, and it might lead to a longer treatment time and less effect. So we may have superficial effect and a transient effect, not permanent. What about the irradiation profile? In the traditional technique, the same amount of power is used all over the area that is irradiated. And as we see here, the demarcation line is not homogeneous. It is deep in the center and superficial at the periphery. And this is called the top hat profile. But if we increase the intensity of UV light by about 30% at the periphery, we will have what is called the donut profile. And by this, we can have uh, more homogeneous uh, demarcation line, as you see here, uh, that is uh, the same depth all over the cornea, all over the uh, irradiated area.
finally, we come to the uh, epi off versus epi on technique. The epi on technique has two types, either chemical or instrumental. Let's start with the chemical. Um, trying to change the composition of the riboflavin uh, or to add some substances that enhance the penetration of this substance uh, or this, the riboflavin through the epithelium. Studies have shown that in this way, we will have very superficial effect. The penetration depth is no more than 80 microns in comparison with the epi off technique. Moreover, the comparative studies have shown that there was no significant difference between recrolin and the control uh, group in comparison with um, patients treated by the standard uh, uh, Dresden protocol. The uh, other uh, epi on technique is the instrumental. We have intrastromal pockets, like creating pockets by femtosecond and irrigating the pocket with the riboflavin for a shorter time, and then the application of UVA. Also, the intrastromal channels, the same principle, but by creating channels instead of a pocket. Also using Shiraz dia disruptor to create fenestrations uh, through the epithelium. Uh, actually, this is uh, a kind of epi-off technique, not an epi-on technique. And finally, we have the iontophoresis. In the iontophoresis, we are using an electric uh, current to enhance the penetration of the rib riboflavin through the uh, epithelium. However, all these ways will produce midway between epi on and epi off technique. So we don't have the, um, the full thickness, almost full thickness, uh, cross-linked tissue um, seen by the uh, epi off technique, and it is not that much uh, superficial. So in conclusion, the best till now is the conventional Dresden protocol using three milliwatt per square centimeter for 30 minutes. And we can use the 9 milliwatt per square centimeter for 10 minutes with the donut profile. Of course, the donut profile is much better than the traditional one. We can use up to 18 milliwatt per square centimeter for 5 minutes. And we have to stay with the epi of technique. Thank you very much. This is the end of part 7. In part 8, I will discuss intracorneal rings in details. Goodbye.